Just pay attention to the family. A long time. I love the community. A long time in my life, too. Uh, but I'm, I'm uh, really, very, we're very pleased with each other. Have you heard about the mysterious death of Clint Eastwood's girlfriend, Christina Sandera? People are talking, and the reactions are as varied as they are intriguing. Clint Eastwood is mourning a heartbreaking loss. The actor's longtime partner, Christina Sandera, has died at the age of 61. But what really happened? Details about her death are still unknown, leaving us all to wonder. Was it natural, or is there more to the story? Death has yet been released. Speculations are swirling, especially considering the rumors that have plagued Christina for years. She was often labeled a gold digger, a term thrown around by her ex and echoed by many. With second marriage officially came to an end in the same year that he connected with his current girlfriend. But was there any truth to it? Did she have ulterior motives in her relationship with Clint Eastwood? Was she really with him for love? Or was there something more sinister at play? Eastwood told the newspaper in May 2020, when you're young, you're very reckless. Then you get conservative. Then you get reckless again. As you get older, you're not afraid of doubt. Christina's past is dotted with accusations and whispers of her trying to take advantage of Eastwood. Could it be that she was indeed trying to thug him, as some claim? Or was she simply a victim of malicious rumors? Why are people so quick to believe the worst about her? And now that she's gone, will we ever find out the truth? I said, I, I know exactly where you're coming from, but read it again because I think we can make a great statement against. And the timing of her death raises even more questions. Why now? Just when these rumors were starting to fade, was her death truly an accident or could it have been staged to cover something up? What did Christina know and who might have wanted her silenced? I really don't have much else that, that concerns me except those those items. So buckle up, because as we dig deeper into Christina Sandera's life and untimely death, we're left with a plethora of questions and very few answers. Was she the gold digger many believed her to be, or was she wrongly accused? What secrets did she take to her grave? And will we ever uncover the truth behind her mysterious death? Clint Eastwood's girlfriend, Christina Sandera, has sadly passed away at 61. In a statement to the Carmel Pine newspaper, the The Mule actor shared the heartbreaking news, saying, Christina was a lovely, caring woman, and I will miss her very much. No other details or cause of death were mentioned. Christina Sandera, Clint Eastwood's girlfriend, lived a very private life, keeping much of their relationship out of the spotlight. The couple met in 2014, shortly after Clint's divorce from Dina Eastwood. Sandera worked as a hostess at the Mission Ranch Hotel, one of Clint's properties, and they quickly hit it off. They kept their relationship mostly under wraps, only making occasional red carpet appearances. The last one they attended together was in November 2019 for the AFI Fest, where they walked hand in hand, smiling ear to ear. Though not much was known about their romance, it's clear they deeply cared for each other. Clint is now mourning the loss of his longtime partner. Clint Eastwood appeared on the red carpet at the Oscars with a beautiful blonde. Everyone asked, who's that? Christina Sandera mostly kept a low profile during her relationship with Clint Eastwood. However, not long after they got together, her past came under scrutiny. In 2015, the Daily Mail reported that Sandera had a run-in with the law during her previous relationship with Paul Wainscote, where she was arrested for domestic battery. According to the outlet, in 2003, before Christina Sandera and Paul Wainscote got married, he called the authorities claiming she attacked him. Although he didn't press charges, a similar incident happened a year later. Shortly after they tied the knot, Wainscote again contacted officials, alleging he was being battered by his wife. The couple eventually divorced, with Wainscote accusing Sandera of being an alcoholic and gold digger, accusations she denied. Despite this, it didn't seem to affect her relationship with Clint Eastwood. As far as the public knows, Christina Sandera and Clint Eastwood never faced the problems she had with her ex. Instead, they were head over heels for each other. In 2020, an insider told Closer, he's truly happy with her. She's fun, easygoing, and his kids like her too. She's on an even keel like he is. They complemented each other well and seem to have moved past their previous relationship issues. But Clint also has a shadier side. Clint Eastwood is undoubtedly a superstar actor and legendary film director. His name is practically synonymous with movie tough guys and that classic macho vibe. But getting to that level wasn't all smooth sailing. His journey is full of scandals, controversies, and broken hearts. Clint's a guy who knows what he wants and goes after it, both on movie sets and in life. He's been a big name since the 1960s and is still going strong in his 90s, leaving a trail of drama behind him. 
Thanks to his consistently hit movies, he's pretty much untouchable in Hollywood, letting him create his own supportive bubble. Eastwood can say or do whatever he wants, and while it might make some headlines, he still reigns supreme in Tinseltown. I think uh, judging uh, uh, material, finding material that's new and interesting for yourself, that becomes new and interesting for the audience. Uh, Philip Kaufman wrote the script for the 1976 Civil War movie, The Outlaw Josie Wales, then got bumped up to director because the film's star and producer Clint Eastwood appreciated Kaufman's creative liberties. In adapting the Forrest Carter source novel, Kaufman opted to have the bad guys relentlessly pursue Eastwood's titular character for the entirety of the film rather than die early on like they do in the book. Once filming began, Kaufman's slow, thoughtful, and deliberate directing style irritated Eastwood. Kaufman took as much time as he needed to frame shots and get the footage he was after. Eastwood preferred to shoot a scene quickly and without fuss and move on. One scene took so long to capture that after Kaufman set off in the desert to find a particular location he'd scouted earlier, Eastwood insubordinately led a small group of crew members and shot the scene himself. A few days later, and under Eastwood's orders, producer Robert Daly fired Kaufman from the outlaw Josie Wales, the new director, Eastwood. But this film was a union production, and thus subject to strict labor rules. When news of Eastwood essentially replacing Kaufman with himself got back to the Directors Guild of America, it passed a new provision in its standard contract. Nicknamed the Clint Eastwood Rule, DGA-affiliated productions cannot allow an actor or actor-producer to take the director's job out from under them. Years, but had never, we'd never worked together, and he was in a mood at that time. He says, I don't want to do any more violent pictures. I'm in the 1970s, Clint Eastwood hired his old friend Fritz Maines to work on his films. Maines toiled on a total of 13 Eastwood movies, variously as a producer, assistant director, stunt performer, and actor. His career in Hollywood and 40-plus year friendship with Eastwood ended when the director made him take the fall for problems with the 1986 movie Heartbreak Ridge, which explored the U.S. military's intervention in Grenada in 1983. The production required the help of the U.S. Marine Corps, and it was Maine's job to be an envoy between the filmmakers and military officials. Those figures, high-ranking individuals in the Marines and the Department of Defense, publicly criticized Heartbreak Ridge upon its release, calling out the film and Eastwood for its numerous factual errors. Because the military wasn't happy, Eastwood blamed Maines and ended his employment. Still hurt by the events nearly 30 years later, Maine said in Patrick McGilligan's Clint the Life and Legend that working alongside Eastwood was categorically tough, with little reward. With this guy, if you got any credit for anything, it was a miracle. Maines also described in the book the time he allegedly witnessed Eastwood assault wife Maggie Johnson. Clint just turned around and knocked Maggie out cold. He really decked her, knocked her clear from the living room into the tub in the bathroom, Maine said via the Irish Independent. Those recollections led to a $10 million libel lawsuit from Eastwood, who sued McGilligan and his publisher for damaging his reputation. Clint Eastwood began a relationship with Sandra Locke while making The Outlaw Josie Wales, and they lived together for more than a decade. For the duration of their time together, Locke's acting career consisted entirely of Eastwood projects. If you were in Clint Eastwood movies, you were in the Clint Eastwood movie business. You weren't in the movie business. You weren't part of Hollywood, Locke told the Washington Post. Locke said she stopped getting offers altogether because filmmakers and casting directors assumed that she only wanted to make movies with Eastwood. Eastwood broke things off with Locke in 1989, and he let her know their relationship was over by waiting until she'd left the home they shared together, changing the locks, and having her possessions removed. Subsequently, Locke learned that Eastwood had taken up with a woman he'd been secretly seeing, with whom he'd had multiple children. Locke found this particularly traumatic because Eastwood had implored her to terminate pregnancies and submit to a tubal ligation procedure to prevent any more. After the split, Locke filed a palimony lawsuit, the spousal support equivalent for unmarried people. Eastwood settled the case and negotiated with Warner Bros. a deal for Locke to direct films and develop screenplays. After three years, Warner Bros. hadn't given Locke any projects, so she sued for fraud, suspecting that the powerful Eastwood made the deal to essentially blacklist her from Hollywood. That suit was settled out of court in 1996. 
While Clint Eastwood himself has conceded that fidelity hadn't been his strong suit, some other allegations involving women surfaced that were far more serious than cheating. In his 1999 book, Clint, The Life and Legend, author Patrick McGilligan spoke with Fritz Maines, who alleged that he'd witnessed Eastwood beating his first wife, Maggie. Maines, who died in 2011, was no mere acquaintance. He and Eastwood had been friends since childhood, and he'd gone on to work as a producer on 17 of Eastwood's movies. The two reportedly had a falling out during the making of Eastwood's 1986 film, Heartbreak Ridge, which resulted in the men severing both their personal and professional relationships. Clint just turned round and knocked Maggie out cold, Maines told McGilligan in an excerpt published in the Irish Independent. He really decked her, knocked her clear from the living room into the tub in the bathroom. Eastwood, however, denied that ever occurred, and fired back by launching a $10 million libel suit against McGilligan and the book's publisher, St. Martin's Press. Clint Eastwood is not only an icon in the entertainment industry, but he is also a family man, Marshall Grossman, Eastwood's lawyer, told Variety when the suit was launched in 2002. He is entitled to have what is written about him be accurate and truthful. That suit was settled in 2004, with details of the financial agreement remaining confidential. History books got things wrong about the Great Depression, and Clint Eastwood may have too. Enduring a hardscrabble childhood amidst that 1930s economic fallout is an often repeated part of Eastwood's story. There was not much employment, not much welfare, people barely got by. People were tougher then, Eastwood told Esquire. We weren't itinerant, it wasn't the grapes of wrath, but it wasn't uptown either, the actor told Rolling Stone. A rough childhood can be a dark and affecting thing, except that Eastwood stretched the truth about his upbringing, according to his former partner, Sandra Locke. When giving testimony in 1996 for a lawsuit filed by Locke, Eastwood again reflected on his financially difficult early years. My father was typical of the Depression era of people. He always preached a hard work ethic, Eastwood testified, according to Locke's memoir, The Good, The Bad, and The Very Ugly. Locke attested that Eastwood's childhood memories weren't accurate, writing that his family never struggled with money and actually lived in a wealthy neighborhood, owned multiple cars, and held a membership at a California country club. Eastwood's courtroom testimony also included a mention of his drafting into the U.S. Army in 1951 during the Korean War. He'd frequently discussed his military service in interviews, but according to Locke, he never saw combat, spending his entire spell in the Army working as a lifeguard at the Fort Ord base in California. When he wasn't down in Los Angeles making movies, Clint Eastwood listed his primary residence in the 1970s and 80s as Carmel-by-the-Sea, a town on the Monterey Peninsula in central coastal California, where he also co-owned the Hogs Breath Inn restaurant. In 1985, the Carmel City Council turned down Eastwood's proposal and plans to build a commercial use facility next to the Hogs Breath Inn. Eastwood sued, and the case was settled before a trial could take place. He reached a settlement with the historical preservation-minded city government of Carmel, but Eastwood remained so annoyed and felt so disrespected by the whole affair that he decided to try and take over the city. In January 1986, Eastwood announced plans to run for mayor, promising to scale back on his movie making in order to focus his attention on Carmel should he win a two-year term. In the April election, Eastwood garnered 72% of the votes, 2,166 in total in a campaign that cost him $40,000. Eastwood's political career ended with his one mayoral term, although he was considered for George H.W. Bush's vice president slot. <laughs> Save a little for Mitt. The first major film role that theatrical actor Francis Fisher scored was a supporting part in the 1989 Clint Eastwood action comedy, Pink Cadillac. Eastwood was in the midst of extracting himself from a relationship with Sandra Locke, and Fisher became his next long-term romantic partner. We know a lot about Eastwood's philandering past, and so did Fisher, but she stayed with the actor for six years, eventually becoming pregnant with their daughter, Franny. Eastwood's behavior during Fisher's labor is what led her to end the relationship. Fisher unexpectedly went into labor five weeks ahead of schedule while spending time at Eastwood's ranch in Northern California, and she was taken by helicopter to a Redding, California hospital. I was in heavy heaving labor. I'd never done this before. He was standing at the back of the room talking golf to the doctor on duty, Fisher told the people via the free library. 
Suddenly, a nurse I didn't recognize walked into the room. She strode straight up to Clint and whispered something I couldn't hear. I heard him reply, it's not appropriate, and I knew she'd asked for his autograph. Eastwood would sign the autograph anyway. And not long after the delivery and discharge, Fisher broke up with Eastwood, moving out of their home and taking their newborn baby daughter. In January 2005, filmmakers Clint Eastwood and Michael Moore were both in attendance at the National Board of Review Awards dinner. Eastwood was representing his film Million Dollar Baby, while Moore was there with Fahrenheit 9-11, a documentary that relied on ambush-style interviews of prominent public figures about U.S. military actions. Eastwood called out Moore's film during his speech that night. Moore if he were to ever interview Eastwood in such a manner, according to Moore's Facebook. To demonstrate that he wasn't kidding, Eastwood repeated himself, simply and bluntly, to Moore, I'll kill you. The crowd still laughed, and so Eastwood spoke over them. I mean it, I'll shoot you. On his Facebook post, Moore provided his take. I should probably stop here and say that I like Clint Eastwood and I think he was a great filmmaker, he wrote, but something started to go haywire with Clint in the last decade. Clint Eastwood has long been known as one of the more conservative big names in the film industry. His politics lean to the right of center, his views corresponding to those of libertarians and republicans. In 2012, Eastwood spoke at the Republican National Convention. Amidst the events that culminated in the nomination of Mitt Romney as the challenger to President Barack Obama as he sought a second term, Eastwood spoke at length in the form of a one-sided conversation. He delivered specific rebukes to Obama, represented in the exchange by an empty chair. While there were questionable things about Obama's presidency, Eastwood's performance was supposed to demonstrate how the president had no excuses or nothing to say to criticism. But to casual viewers, the bit of theater just looked like an elderly gentleman talking to somebody who wasn't there. Oh, Romney, I can't tell him to do that. I can't do that to himself. When asked by a reporter in 2016 about the state of American presidential politics, Eastwood admitted that he regretted the format of that speech. What troubles me is, I guess when I did that silly thing at the Republican convention talking to the chair, Eastwood told Esquire. Kathy Scruggs, a police beat reporter for one of the USC. S major newspapers, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, became moderately famous when she reported on the terrorist bombing of Centennial Olympic Park during Atlanta's 1996 Summer Olympics. Scruggs' stories were among the first filed about the event and investigation, and she broke the news that the top suspect in the crime was a security guard named Richard Jewell. Scruggs cited federal authorities as her source. The truth about the Atlanta 1996 Olympics bombing would eventually emerge, and Jewel would be completely exonerated, but he'd forever be linked to the horrific crime, leading him to sue the Atlanta Journal-Constitution for besmirching his good name. In court proceedings, Scruggs declined to identify her exact federal source for the Jewel allegations. She was threatened with imprisonment for her refusal. Scruggs died in 2001, long before the 2019 release of the Clint Eastwood-directed Richard Jewell. Olivia Wilde played the prominent role of Scruggs in the movie, which purported to expose how the Atlanta Journal-Constitution ruined Jewel's life, with malicious and negligent intent on the part of Scruggs. To get her information, the film theorizes, Scruggs offers favors to an FBI agent. On behalf of itself and the estate of Scruggs, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution filed a lawsuit against producer Warner Bros, alleging that Eastwood created a false and defamatory portrait of its deceased reporter. At the 2008 Cannes Film Festival, Spike Lee promoted Miracle at St. Anna, a World War II drama with a main cast of black actors. While talking to reporters, he criticized Clint Eastwood's two 2006 World War II films, Flags of Our Fathers and Letters from Iwo Jima, for a lack of black characters. Clint Eastwood made two films about Iwo Jima that ran for more than four hours total, and there was not one Negro actor on the screen, Lee said, via The Guardian. I know it was pointed out to him and that he could have changed it. It's not like he didn't know. Eastwood responded to Lee's criticism in The Guardian, allowing that while a small number of black soldiers were present at Iwo Jima, none were photographed. They didn't raise the flag. The story is Flags of Our Fathers, the famous flag-raising picture. And they didn't do that. If I go ahead and put an African-American actor in there, people'd go, this guy's lost his mind, Eastwood said, adding of Lee, a guy like him should shut his face. Celebrity feuds can get out of hand, and this one took a third major filmmaker to resolve it.
Lee ran into Steven Spielberg at a basketball game and explained his side, and Spielberg promised to reach out to Eastwood. And it's hunky-dory, he said he was gonna make a call to Eastwood, he made it squashed, Lee told Access. Expecting to win the Best Actor Oscar for The Godfather at the 1973 Academy Awards, Marlon Brando sent Sachin Littlefeather, president of the National Native American Affirmative Image Committee, to refuse his award as a protest. And the reasons for this are the treatment of American Indians today by the film industry, Littlefeather said to both boos and cheers. I beg at this time that I have not intruded upon this evening, and that we will in the future, our hearts and our understandings, will meet with love and generosity. A few minutes later, Clint Eastwood headed out on stage to present an Oscar, and he made some withering put-downs about the Little Feather speech. I don't know if I should present this award on behalf of all the cowboys shot in all the John Ford westerns over the years, he quipped, via The Guardian. Flash forward to 2016 and an Eastwood interview with Esquire, in which the celebrity spoke highly of the presidential candidacy of Donald Trump as it served as an antidote to cultural trends that bugged him. He's on to something because secretly everybody's getting tired of political correctness kissing up. That's the kiss-a generation we're in right now. We're really in a P generation, Eastwood said. We see people accusing people of being racist and all kinds of stuff. When I grew up, those things weren't called racist. So from his past, it can be concluded that he has a very dominating personality, and that he may also have dominated Christina. But Christina's past is also tangled, and it's a very messed up situation. One person wrote, She didn't have an easy life, but she kept going bravely and did the best she could in that misogynistic society. Rip miss. Another one added, Lesson, expel toxic people from your life. Respect her for fighting for herself. I hope she finds peace. That's it for today. See you in the next video. Until then, goodbye.